tonight we're going to finish up chapter five with uh no we're going to finish up chapter six layout themes and html so ryan's going to finish that up and then we'll jump over to the other ryan and ryan will start doing graphics um we'll see how far we get and then for next week kevin has graciously taken on the present or the presentation responsibilities and is going to present number eight user feedback so we'll see how far we get tonight kevin but Right now you're on deck. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to turn it over to Ryan and we'll let you go. Thanks, Colin. So I'm going to share my screen team. Uh, when we when we left off last week, uh, it trailed into a couple of minutes after we always try and stay within that one hour period of time. And let's see, share, make sure that that's coming through on your end. I'm going to move this over here to my side. Okay. What I wanted to start off with I had promised Colin uh, going back and forth, preparing for last week and then even finishing with this week. What I was trying to do is upgrade. I've got two different instances of the same service. One is my local desktop version. And then I also have a RStudio web server and Shiny web server. So this is in a different room. It's across the hallway from me. What I was telling Colin is it's easy to upgrade your desktop environment. It's a little bit tricky with the web server. Uh, it's, it has a lot more to do with the interface itself. So Colin, unfortunately I did not upgrade the web server, I apologize. Um, I'm still working towards that uh, end goal though. So team, what I'm gonna show you today is out of the book, this is the last uh, chunk. And, and for Ryan, your benefit, I'm hoping to only be maybe 10 to 15 minutes tops, hopefully. Um, what I wanted to show everybody is the last example, and I've got this listed as uh, paragraph 6.10 in our, in our shiny book, what they're doing here is now starting to get into uh, bootstrap libraries, okay, bslib. Now, bslib is a different package. So, okay, before I even make that comment, let's briefly talk about the web services in the, in, in the wild. You've got your HTML file using a Darwin architecture of tagging, XML, SGML, HTML, they all kind of have a similar format. You have your CSS, cascading style sheet. Um, that is going to give you the look and the feel of the instructions for that text. If you want to get into the new word technology, then you're going to get into CSS or uh, SASS, SAS. Am I saying that correctly? There's two different uh, splits between it. Uh, CSS3, and then if you get into some other uh, uh, functions, it changes the form of the text. And I believe in the in the document, uh, I think it's C -A -C -S -A -S -S. Um Okay, so that statement is just cascading style sheets in a different form. So always remember you have to have a CSS. The third is the JavaScript itself. So here's how I want you to always remember web development, and it'll help you in, in understanding, comprehending what's going on from Shiny as it changes protocol. You have your HTML file. That's our instruction. You have your CSS, the look and the feel of the, doc, the document or what you're presenting. And then the JavaScript is that interactive point. Well, there's multiple different JavaScript libraries. You have Angular, Ember, uh, Node.js technically isn't a JavaScript library. It's a C language that transposes. But anyway, there's these different underlying web interface tools. When you evoke a bootstrap library, you're not using the vanilla flavor that comes along with R. Okay, so for the entire team and from this point moving forward to the rest of the document, always remember that if you want to stay within the herd, you want to stay close and near and dear to everybody to answer simple questions, that's okay. If you really want to start to branch off and, and give yourself your web page this really awesome look and feel, you're going to have to get into this uh, uh, bootstrap library, bslib uh, library. Okay. So this example, what I'm doing is I'm calling on the library bslib, um, and I bet you anything, yeah, okay, it's working fine. Um, I'm calling on the Shiny library, and I'm calling on the ggplot2 library. Now, I didn't create this code. I'm just taking a snippet out of the book. But you'll notice that we're calling on a fluid page, and then I'm adding a theme variable. This is the first time that we're witnessing this argument of theme. Well, because we're, we're using this BS library call, I have this option 
theme equals BS lib, and then I'm passing BS theme boost, uh, uh, is it boots watch, and then equals darkly. Well, this, I, I'm, I'm always a big darkly or a dark fan. So uh, whenever I get this kind of gray on gray is, is my preferred appearance. We ha have a title page, a themed plot, just like we have listed. Um, and then the plot output is plot. Uh, down here on the server's side, I'm taking that same thematic, which would be again, theme and thematic, these two linked together. And I'm calling it thematic sh uh, shiny. My output is plot because I'm calling my plot output at the top of the app. So output plot equals render plot. Inside that function call render plot, I'm passing it a GG plot using MT cars, using the AES, what Ryan has shared in the past with the, I think that's weight, that weight, and then miles per gallon, the heavier the vehicle and how much miles per gallon it, it gets. Now I've got two <coughs> services here. I'm, I'm rendering, uh, I think that was from our GG plot, uh, cohort, Ryan, that you mentioned this AES aesthetics, but I'm calling on the ge geome point system and the geome smooth system. So what I've rendered is obviously the intersection of these two XY coordinate systems uh, with data points. And then I use a smooth uh, uh, variable to link all those together, like the median of all of the, the plotted points. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, is switch over to the HTML side. So we can do all of this in R, but it doesn't give you all the flavor that you really need to from the web development side. And so I'm going to open Chrome, right? And I did the function F12. So this is the same plot. Now I'm going to go into uh, Chrome's development tools, which is F12, at least on, on this computer, um, Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, uh, Safari, uh, Firefox, all of these different web browsers uh, may have a different function for the development tools. But inside, what I really want the team to recognize is the HTML that Shiny is generating. Okay, uh, Shane, last week, uh, I think I changed something for you just to, to show you that it was uh, more interactive. Uh, where was my theme plot at? I'm actually looking for this person right here, inspect. And that snaps it off right here. So a theme plot. And I, I had this changed just to say, I don't know, Colin, uh, spell Colin's last name correctly. All right. When I hit enter, it changes, right? Okay. But remember, I'm not affecting the server. I'm only affecting the, the Chrome presentation or the document object model of this output. If I hit my refresh key uh, or F5 uh, refresh, you're going to see it should go back, I thought. No, it's not going back. Oh, sorry, it's rendering. So it's non-persistent. So I want you to remember what I just did there. In one factor, I'm calling from the server, but yet modifying it locally to my one machine. When I refresh the browser and I get that, that uh, plot output from the server again, refresh the browser, it changes back to what it was. Connor, I, I'm kind of interested. I know you weren't with us last week, sir, um, but you've, you've talked about web development in the past. Uh, do you want to add anything with your, your opportunity at all? Have you done uh, this before? If I did speak about, about web development, it wasn't with any, with any authority, I assure you. Okay, <laughs> good, sir, no worries. Um, Shane, does this answer your question, like the, the different theming and that kind of stuff? Or, yeah, or for sure. this um, CSS. Okay. I, I do have a question on uh, the server function. What's this, um, this call this thematic function uh, within the server function, what is that actually doing? Like it makes sense so, that we would define the theme up in the UI. Um, it, in, in the past chapters, when we were dis, uh, discussing reactive code, uh, there are uh, discussions between the app side and the server side of Shiny. So you've got just, this is common web socketing is what's happening. You've got a application that's serving information and another application that's receiving it and processing it or viewing it. So this handshake between app and server, you're always going to have this complementary exchange of code. Uh, we talk a, a lot and I, I, I wanna say it was in chapter five, Ryan, I think you presented for chapter five, wasn't it? There was a, there, or maybe call in chapter four, there was a, there was one presenter where we were discussing the 
app side of serving information and the, uh, excuse me, the server side of serving information and the app side of consumption and presentation, they're always going to be complementary of each other. Um, let me, what I was gonna do is go bslib, uh, bslib, and then thematic. See what that search comes up with. Yeah, uh, SASS, SAS, themes for Shiny and R Markdown. Um, I found that the BSLib library uh, is helpful if you know a lot about HTML, not so helpful if you're only with R. So if I look at Control F thematic, we're not going to find any search term for that point. But if I use theme instead, I'm going to get that hit quite often. So thematic is, is just a, a server call that is linking with that theme that I'm, I'm creating my app with. I'm using the darkly theme. So the thematic uh, server function is tying that together. Gotcha. Uh, let's see. I may not be explaining it quite eloquently. Well, that sounds like you're actually doing like look and feel and presentation on the server side. Um, no, I think what it's doing, Ryan, is we're asking the, we're designing the look and feel of the web page using common CSS. But this is a, a bootstrap library, right? It's a bootstrap uh, 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 general call. I can go down a whole bunch of different rabbit holes on on theming of you know what your web page looks like. This uh, uh, the widgets, not widgets, the Oh, what's that? What's that word called? It's a it's a it's a document that has all your different uh, objects of you know emoji con or emoji emoji whatever those are the the little symbols. Um, your uh, there's a, there's a term that's that's called on. It's a theme that you pull in. That may be part of these different calls. I wanted to present today, and I haven't found it yet. I wanted to give a BS library hey, these are the 18 different libraries that you can use as vanilla flavor if you go this route. Right. Um, let me give it a different way. Sorry, guys. I'm going kind of off the chart here. Hey, Ryan, can we yeah. try something? Um, yeah, go ahead. I just threw a link in there from our studio. I think in yeah. this case, that thematic shiny function might okay. be able to be called outside of the server function. And it's. I think it's just applying that dark shape to, or dark uh, overlay to it. Yeah, what, <clears throat> what you find a lot in these frameworks, that's actually what Bootstrap is, it's a framework. What you'll find in these frameworks are other developers. Um, if you've ever done like uh, uh, cron jobs, uh, do you know uh, what's that utility called on Linux where they have this little tiny widget that gives all your CPU resources and all that stuff. There's an entire community that just focuses on presentation right? The look of your Linux environment, the different desktops and color codes and all this theming stuff, right? That's really what SASS is, or that's what Bootstrap as a framework is providing you. So I just call on Darkly and automatically it cascades into all of these different color codes and, 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 and theming uh, that goes along with it. What I wanted to provide you as the link would be the, the, so, uh, the different terms that you can use within that. Darkly is probably one term. And what I was wanting to show you is in our studio, if you go into your, I think preferences, is that right? Uh, project, no, global options. And then go into theming. Color. Yeah, exactly, right. So these editor themes, right? If I change it to GOB, I don't know what GOB is, but when I apply it, right? I haven't done anything to my R studio environment. I just change the appearance around it. That's kind of what that theme is doing here. Excuse me, let me close that. Sorry, guys. Um, that's what I'm doing with this. I don't know what the other options are. And even if you do a help function on that one point, let's see, show help. I didn't find much uh, assistance here with these different themes, right? This is all fine. This is in your CSS or SASS. You <clears throat> you have all of these different points that you can control. It's not vanilla. You actually get to go in here and manipulate these. Um, but I, I didn't find one that just says, here, these are the eight themes that are out there. 
right. you've probably got some developer. Let's just use uh, Chain yourself. You want to create your own personal theme, and then Ryan says, "Well, I'm going to access, you know, Shane's theme for my particular Shiny app. All I have to do is make that call, and magically it it it, it appears uh, output wise. Yeah, it's it go ahead. I was going to say it looks like thematic, and I kind of discovered this. I'm putting two and two together. It looks like thematic puts your um, the theme to the plot." And that's what okay. I just seen in one of my apps. If reading oh. the link, it is applying the theme of dark to the plots. Okay. And I realize that's probably why my uh, my app that the when it turns to dark mode, it's not applying to the necessarily the app. That's right. I think it. I think it takes the theme elements from the UI. Okay. And applies them to the render plot. So let's, uh, I don't know, white, see if that, does that do anything? So Save Ryan, I, I, Go ahead. Pass, I pass along a link. Um, it's, it's, yeah. watch, if you go to this, like if you, if you type in the question mark uh, for your docs, if you go question mark BS theme, okay. it will have a link to this for the choose a boot swatch theme. And so that it will have the, so question mark BS lib, Colon, colon. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me add that. Yes, um, theme. Say BS. Question mark. VS lib. Colon, colon. VS theme. And then if you just look at the docs and then you scroll down to the description and choose a boot swatch theme. Oh, yeah. Go down to the description. Description. Keep. Is that it? Uh, is this the right docs? Because well, I, I did. Go ahead. Well, what I was going to tell you is, is in most cases, in most theming type cases, just like I gave the example of the RStudio environment, when you go to your theme options, the CSS, the well, it doesn't change the HTML, it just changes the CSS attributes. Um, all of these different options, that's kind of what I'm looking for. I would like to see in this BS theme function call, what are my options that I can change to? I don't, I, I haven't found anything yet that, that just clearly defined, if I change this back to darkly, right? What are the other options that I can, I can put in here? Um, the aesthetics of your ggplot is kind of what I'm looking at here. What are the additional services that I can render within that one function call? Yeah, so if you go to, if you go to that bootswatch.com that I pass along in the chat, okay. It yep. will give you some of the stock ones that you have. So like if you do, if you scroll down, you can see like Cyborg, Cosmo, if you put those yeah, names in there. Let's let's try that real quick. And I, I'm trying to finish so that I can give Ryan enough time tonight. Uh, uh, Cyborg. And Colin, it sounds like what you're saying is by calling that thematic shiny function within the server, it's just going to grab whatever theme was supplied in the UI and apply that to whatever plots are being output via the server function. Yes. I think so. I think so. And I was like kind of thinking about that myself. And I was just trying to think about, I'm not sure if people are familiar with like the theme set that you can do at the top of your scripts to like set common themes for all of your plots. I usually right. use it in scripts, but I don't know the relationship between this thematic and that theme set. You know, if it's something There's, completely different or if, it, if they're related. That first link in the um, chat goes to our studio right up on it. And it looks like you can actually call that thematic function outside of the, ther the server function too, if you feed it an argument. Um, okay. But in this case, I think now it makes sense what you said about like it's, if you call it within the server function, then it's going to go try to reference whatever is in the UI as its input. Yeah. Can, do you do you mind if I take us outside the the subject of our studio for just a brief moment? I, I do know what I'm trying to convey, but I don't know if it's 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 really uh, sinking in uh, because I'm not familiar with the packages of what this BS lib is doing. There's a whole infrastructure built around this. I am familiar with a different application that does the same theming service, um, and that's called uh, Reveal JS. And and in truth, we haven't got to it yet, uh, but that's what. Our studio uses as a back end for presentation output. If you create a presentation form, you're going to get a reveal JS output. And if I went 
to this web page briefly for a second and you talk about themes, uh, where is that at? Themes, okay. Here's actually what the list that I'm trying to call on. So right. if we used Darkly as an option or, or, or Shane to your link with that thematic, if, if or Colin with your, your uh, BS theme or Boots theme, if I want to paste something in, it would already be in the CSS language. When I call on that, it's going to use a different grouping of that CSS. A lot of our web services do this, and, and it's amazing to watch because you can have a CSS that lives completely autonomous from your, your web application, and all you have to do is point at that web service, and then immediately your document object itself, your client, is going to reach out and grab that as it's constructing the file or, or constructing the presentation. It's, it, it blows your mind when you start to really link of, I've got a, a JavaScript library that lives on some server somewhere else, and I got a CSS that lives over here that I'd like to use. And you start to thread or stitch these together. The framework, this boot, uh, BS uh, lib package or this, this bootstrap lib package, it's allowing you to orchestrate that all within one container. You don't have to reach out into the ether and grab it. Right? Does that help? understand or comprehend what I'm what I'm discussing with this theme and, and presentation at all? Possibly not. No, was, yeah, it gives a, a lot more context like where this is actually pulling from and what you know what's being used on the front end to make it yes. Aesthetic. All of those all of those are going to so the, the, the team I have a sense that we don't have a, a really strong web presence, web development presence all of those different calls are going to be in your head of the HTML file. So you have a special uh, a tag called head and inside here would be all these pointers. You know, it could be on your local machine. It could be on the web server. It could be someplace out in the ether, but you're pointing at that and then it would automatically bring that language in. That's what the function of head does. So bootstrap as a, uh, as a framework for web development gives you access to extend or, or beyond the vanilla flavor of what Shiny does, you know, white background, uh, you know, the, the common uh, 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 HTML layout placement that I was talking about last week. Now we're kind of extending even further into an area of, of probably not as familiar. But if you, if you start to comprehend the simplicity of what a HTML file is, what a CSS and a JavaScript file does, right? Then it, it becomes mind blowing. There was uh, uh, earlier today, and I'm still toying with the idea, there's a, a service that uh, is called Obsidian. Now, if you currently use it, feel welcome to, to uh, talk about it. Um, I'm kind of slowly jump, jumping into it, but it's a, uh, it's a note taking app that is uh, more like mind mapping. And uh, uh, within that, it actually calls the JavaScript MathJax as a uh, call. Uh, MathJax allows you to do a lot of LaTeX type coding. Uh, you can make these beautiful equations on a web page. Just an example. <laughs> I'm going to stop now. Uh, uh, Colin, I think I'm finished unless you have any more questions. Um, I will do my best as the cohort to try and infuse some more ancillary reading beyond just the uh, shiny app book uh, or expand on any of the topics that this particular chapter uh, opened up. This is a really, really big chapter, but it's at the cornerstone of, of how shiny works or how the, how the, uh, the uh, compiling from our code into web development code. Um, wait, if, 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 if the team, if you don't mind me, making one last comment. When Russ finally posts the EPGS uh, 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 cohort from this morning, um, my mind was blown. We had a, a user that initially just joined the group and uh, he opened up and, and shared his screen of this crazy shiny app. It was a full development environment. It blew my mind to think that there was that much of awesome sauce going into to what this person was doing. Um, I had never considered Shiny being that large of, of a framework. Um, it, it was almost, I had it in the back of my mind, like, I don't know if I would even use Shiny 
to do what he was doing uh, with, with the uh, web development side. Um, I don't know if R would be my correct language to author in to produce what he was doing. I would almost back up and say, let's choose a different CMS framework before I, I went further into the, into the topic. So at any rate, Colin, I'm, I'm, I'm finished, sir. Cool. Thanks, Ryan. I really appreciate you um, taking that on and, and sharing a lot, um, sir. sharing a bunch of information, both from the book and then from your expertise as well. So I appreciate your time. So I think uh, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, maybe we can wait till maybe the end here so we can start talking a little bit about graphics. And so we'll switch over to the other Ryan and then we'll go from there. So Ryan, you're up. <laughs> All right, cool. Hey everybody. So we'll move on into chapter seven here. And um, you know, one of the great things about uh, this cohort is that it's number two and that there was also a cohort number one. And so a lot of those notes are already available. And so I'm just going to uh, give some uh, a high five to Jess Mercury uh, here and use that person's slides to go through what we've got here. So, um, so the big the big takeaway for this chapter is creating interactive plots, responsive plots, and rendering plots. So, uh, up until now, we have only uh, we've only used. Uh, our, our user interface, the plots themselves have been static and there's no, there hasn't been a way to interact with them, select elements on those plots. Uh, in chapter seven, now we do get to the point where we can start interacting with some of those. So, um, so here are some of the ways that, that you can interact with, with uh, an individual plot. So <clears throat> clicking on the plot, um, picking up on other, on points that are near to where you click, brushing, which is like uh, clicking and dragging over a region, modifying the plot interactivity limitations. So um, uh, hovering is another one, and then double clicking are, the, are some of the main ones there. All right. So that's what it says here, that a plot can respond to four different mouse actions, clicking, double clicking, hovering, and brush a rectangular selection tool. This says note the use of REQ to make sure the app doesn't do anything before the first click and that the coordinates are in terms of the underlying weight and MPG variables. Um, if, if I'm not too familiar with REQ, I didn't understand that as I was going through it. So we'll, um, if somebody wants to, to weigh in on that, uh, we can maybe uh, in, in a few more slides, we'll get to that. <clears throat> okay, so clicking. Clicking allows you to uh, to click on the plot and and it'll it'll interact with it that way. Let me see where we go. Okay, so let me come back over. Can everybody see our studio now? Now it is okay. Cool. All right. So let, this is this is the original, a really basic um, app that we have worked with in the past. And as we mentioned, there's no interactivity on this. So if we run this one. Any kind of clicking onto on this plot does nothing. Clicking and dragging basically just moves the image. I just move the image, right? So as we move on into different things that we can do, so this this next one has the click interactivity. And you can see the main change here is that on this UI, the fluid page, the output, the plot output, it just says plot. Um, there's no interactivity there. In order to add that interactivity, we add in an argument here called click equals plot click, okay? And so now we've made a change to where we can actually interact with that. <clears throat> you can see also that, that that argument, the plot click argument comes in down over here, input dollar sign plot click X and plot click Y. And so by, um, by, by adding those arguments in down here on the bottom, uh, it updates the some of the output, this render print gets gets uh, adjusted based off of where those clicks happen. So it's easy to easier to understand that when you see it on the plot here. So now as we click on different locations, you can see that the that the coordinates of that print down here at the bottom. So clicking around, we're actually interacting with this plot now. Okay, cool. Seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. 
I'm just now noticing, sorry, this is a little off topic, but um, when we're defining our X and Y objects in the um, that render print function, I am now noticing that it uses an accessor twice. So we're doing input dollar sign plot click dollar sign X. I have never seen that before in R code. Is that, I feel like now I'm just now seeing it and it's like verbatim out of the book. That's, it just, it's yeah. weird and I'm curious what's going on there. Yeah, I hadn't noticed, I mean, I had noticed that earlier as well. I don't have any, any other information to add on to it other than knowing that when you click somewhere there, you're going to be clicking it in an X location and in a Y location. So there's every right. click is going to have both of those. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I had never seen like the two dollar signs. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, it makes sense how it would be grabbing it. Like, yeah. I, I think it's just a list with with multiple like levels. Yeah, I right. was going to say okay. the the pointer data frame pointer. So you're 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 telling it go to the input from the user create the data frame called plot click and then accessing the uh, X variable and the Y variable. Uh, does that make, are you, are you thinking the same way, Connor? Yeah. Like it, it's the data frame and then a unique identifier in the data frame or in the list, well, I suppose. But it's, but it's, it's like an object with multiple, but, but then it's an object of objects. So object one is input. Object two is plot click. And then that has other objects, X and Y. It's like a so, nesting yeah. doll sort of thing. Yeah. W would there be a way to see this object um, in rendered in like in a viewer or, or even in the console? Or you something? could do render verbatim, probably. Or you so, could drop a browser. You could drop a yeah, browser in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or a breakpoint, too. If you drop a browser or a breakpoint in there. Just drop a browser in there. All right, let's see what happens. Well, you miss, uh, you're missing an S in browser. No, that happened to me earlier today, too. Yeah. All right, I didn't mean to derail this, but it's a no, no, this is good. Yeah. Interesting, interesting thing. Browser, OK. Um, let's see, I got it. What do I got to do here? I think it's running uh, something. Must be running somewhere. Mm. No, no. Um, because you're in your server, so you're dropping a browser in there. Oh well, because it, it's not going to kick off your browser until you interact with it, because it's not. So. Okay. Uh, Is this what we were looking for? Yeah, if you click around in the image. In the plot. Yep. But this is interesting. In your, in your console, it might be coming up now, though. We should be able to enter, like, cycle through it. You might want to put browser at line 19 instead of 18. Okay. Yeah. Like that? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying. Oh, to so it calls it after the click. Gotcha. Yeah. That's interesting because it's trying to, because of your output, your verbatim text output, it seems like it's trying to put that output into that text, that verbatim text output. Hmm. Uh, has it not created the object then? So from the mouse click, the mouse listener, when you click the, the vector graphic, it's looking at the place of the cursor to populate the X and Y coordinates. If the browser call is before Connor mentioned uh, uh, line 19, would it help if you put it maybe between lines 21 and 22 so that you've already clicked and created the data element and then we can inspect it? Does that so do anything? Maybe right here? Yeah, yes. Let's see. You guys know you could probably like tell me to code in a virus into my R script and I would just do it. So I, I, I feel it seems like there it's creating an object here. It's loading it, it somewhere, almost like a document, because there's a there's a reference here. It would be in memory, yeah. It, it, it's it's an index in memory of that stored data frame. So if you notice the two point nine eight and the twenty eight point six seven, 
Uh, yeah. Is it possible to select another cell? Does it? Yeah. So what you're doing, obviously, it's like playing Battleship, right? So you've got an X and Y coordinate system. When your mouse, you do the, the left click, it automatically populates the X and Y coordinates of that vector graphic. Sure. Yeah, it, I, was, I was interested in seeing this, uh, this object, though, if, if there is such a thing as input plot click. You Maybe. might, oh, sorry, Ryan. Go ahead. You might try and put the browser outside just right in this, like the first line after your server call. So like right at line 12 and then um, see if it goes there. And then you might be able to access that input after a click. So if you click it, debug, yeah, see so your, I think you're in your debugger now. So if you click it, and you go over and see uh, it in the console console hmm that's uh, odd hmm. anyway are we okay. we're not able to call a class function outside of that server function and reference the object in it are we but it seems i don't get good vibes from that but it's, it seems so if, if you do uh if you add another render like another output thing do output in the dollar sign like metadata or click data or something like right here. And then feed that input pluck click X into that. Yeah. I need to add a, a UI up here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just an, another verbatim, probably. And then do like STL, STR on that input thing. Okay. Or maybe just, yeah. So do, yeah, I'll put and then just call it whatever you want. Right. And then render print. And then let's do, let's just do, yeah, str and then input plot click and just go that far okay. and see what happens. Hey, there you go. Dang. So it's a list yeah. of lists. Yep. I also I also dropped there's a link in the chapter in chapter seven that has a bunch of those widgets for like clicking and stuff. And in there there's the same thing with the clicking too. It will show you the plot click, the the list object that you have, and then for the hover as well. So if you go to that link that I just put up in the chat. It will show you the same list object as well. And if you notice, it said null at the beginning. Yeah. Because you hadn't clicked on anything and you didn't set a rec oh. to click first. So if you click in that plot there, it will populate that list object both for the hover and the click. I thought this was kind of a neat tool that yeah. was linked. So the That's hover doesn't seem to be refreshing, but uh, it's because I'm not waiting long enough. There we go. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> so that's what it creates, this whole list. An X and Y, chords, chords, image, mapping, domain. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so Connor, that's what you were getting at as far as like the double accessor thing. It's like looking at the first list and then going next level deeper and looking at an element within that list. Right. One of the things I find amazing about Shiny or about R as a service, it, all of the plotted outputs are vector form. So SVG is part of the WC3 consortium library and you can manipulate that image in your browser. That's what we're really talking about here. This click option of, of you know, hovering your mouse and, 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 selecting something uh, because it's vector. I don't know if this would work the same way if it was a, a raster format. Yeah. If, if let me, I'll, I'll try to find a good link or a reference to some vector content as well uh, to support uh, the uh, chapter six. Uh, it's not part of that section, but um, it may support what you're, you're doing, Ryan, or, or even with this uh, click option example you've got. Cool. 
Um, the next uh, example that it has uses near points, which I thought was a kind of an interesting one. So <clears throat> here it can pick up if you're clicking near a point, then it'll recognize that if you click far away from a point as I am now, then it's not going to, uh, to put anything into the table here. But if you click near a point or near enough to a point, then it'll pick up on the fact that you're close to, to a point there. I'm sure there's some application of, of that. Then I'll go on to the next one here, which was the brush points. So this is the one where you get to click and drag a region and select a certain number of points. And then those will all show up down in the table at the bottom. Whether it's you know whether it's two points or or many points, then they'll all show up. <clears throat> the other thing to that I noticed on this one as well was the use of this all rows argument. And maybe you've seen it already, but if you change this to true, then then it the table will it'll show all of the rows, and then there'll just be an additional column that shows which ones are selected. So right now I have the selected column, and everything's false. <laughs> but then as we select a few, you can see that they start to turn to true in the cases where those are selected. Okay. All right. And then, all right, so then um, this is a way to have the plot inner, the plot itself react to interaction. So what we've seen so far is the plots, the uh, interacting with the plot informs a different output. It informs a table or it informs a, uh, uh, a verbatim. This and this uh, application here, interacting with the plot changes the plot itself. And what it does is it changes the size of the of the dots so that they um, so that they're smaller, closer to the places that you click and farther away, if it's farther away from the spot that you click. Now there's a comment in the book here about this ability for plots to, to update based off of interaction, that there's a delay there because the whole system has to obviously re-render, has to send the input over to the server, has to re-render the output and then send it back. So in a, in a simple plot like this, it looks like it's instantaneous, but um, in more complex plots, it probably wouldn't look, look as instantaneous. So Cool. The other thing that I tried to do, you can tell here, was that uh, I wanted to see if we could make it show the distance that each, uh, each dot is from where you click. And it seems to do it for like a brief, a brief flash, if you can see that there. Um, I don't know how to keep it persistent. So I put that as a question here in this exercise is how to add a table which shows the distances from the click. Anybody uh, have any ideas or do you want to tackle this one in the few, for a few minutes? I wonder if you change it from click to hover. Right here, change this. Yeah. Okay. Is, is it plot hover? I forget. I think so. So then we'll have to change this, right, as well. Oh, we got to change it a few. Well, um, Connor, do you mean changing the what we're naming it, or changing the actual argument itself? The actual argument. Yeah. Yeah. Can we pass the click? Is, the click is probably unless you store. You could store the x, y at the click, and then use that to, cal to calculate the distance. Because the click is probably, you know, it's only, it's not persistent. It just, it's a, it comes and goes, right? So that's so the click. Okay, I hadn't thought about the click being click. I hadn't thought about the click that way before. So it really is just it exists just for the the length of the click. Yeah, so if we try hover instead of a plot click. Okay, so change it here? Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. Click equals, yeah. And then, and then also down below. Everywhere, right? Observe event hover. 
distance is going to be input hover. And then output table is going to be hover. I think I got them all. All right. Okay, hovering. Hmm. Um, we may want to change the in the plot output function instead of click equals, try hover equals, and we can name we can keep the name. Oh yeah, that's right. We can keep the name hover if we want because it's already updated all through there. But we we'll want to change like the type of the there argument that we're passing to it. That's right. Okay. Rats. You're getting closer. Well, yeah. if you hover over one of the large dots now, I think we got something there for a second. Then they become a small dot. I don't think it was our distances, though. The first thought that comes to mind when when I'm watching Ryan re, uh, change this code, the uh, list that that column, the uh, the distance variable uh, flashing like that, it's almost like the server is refreshing or or the being the non persistent that Iki mentioned. Um, what inside that call could we add that would provide us that option of maintaining? I'm looking down at the bottom as maybe the uh, add distribution equals true, or maybe all rows equals true. Like maybe one of those, is there another variable that we could add to line 20 that might keep it? Line 30. Or is it maybe line 30? Yeah, the render table. Is there maybe something inside there that's creating that refresh? I don't know what it would be. That's where I, I have to actually look at the document. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head what, what we could add. That's okay. I, I thought I'd throw it out there to see um, since I, I don't know. For me, the, the learning comes with the exploration of the, the different ideas. So um, not a big hey, deal unless anybody wants to take one final swing at it. Um, I have a couple ideas that are kind of half-baked right now, but can you drop this in the Slack because it's it's bothering me. I think I can, I think I can hack at it for a little bit. I got some half-baked ideas, but I just don't want to think out loud. So um, if you could pass that in the Slack, that'd be great. Sure. No problem. All right. Then the only last one here was um, interactivity to change colors. Uh, it, there's nothing really too new on this other than just the idea of um, just seeing it because it's, it's the same sort of thing where you're interacting with the plot. In this case, it allows you to select a few and then they change colors to true, um, alt, and then to reset it all, you double click. So, um, so that's, that's the action that takes place here. And then just going through the, uh, through the different, um, the, the code portion to understand what's happening there. Um, so if there's an observe event, which is the actual, you know, the clicking and dragging. And there's the double clicking as well here um, to, to reset it. Selected um, becomes false for everything. And then the render plot as well. So if you haven't had a chance to look through these or wanted to explore them, obviously these are just taken straight from the book. So feel free to do that. Okay. Any other questions, thoughts? All right, let's see what else we have here. I think we covered pretty much everything that was here. There were a couple of other activities where you could you could pull an image, like an online in, an online image, and load that in. Uh, we didn't get to that one, but you you know that it's there. Um, I think that's really it. Um, and anybody else want to? weigh in a little bit more on this REQ and what it does. Although I think we saw some of the examples of it that there was nothing there. There was no click first. And so uh, so it showed up as null. 
Does that the idea mean, does it mean like don't take any action or don't, don't refresh until this action is taken? It, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't even like it instantiate like the, the, the action, start the action until like if you look at the documentation for, for, for that function, it looks for a truthy uh, value, which typically means like non-null. So it's saying look for the, these required values and you can, if they're, is it looking for a bully, like a true false, or is it looking for just like you said, a non-null? It, it can depend on, I think it can depend on the object. Okay, so like selected, equals true or false, and it's going to be looking for a true, like for, for a click anyway. Does that make, am I on the right track with that? Yeah, it's not, it's not quite like filter in dplyr or something, where like okay. filter on all the things that are true. It's a little bit more shiny than that. <laughs> okay. I feel like that's where my head's defaulting to. <laughs> So if we look at it right here, this is where that that uh, code comes in. Require input plot click, right? So it's saying then that it's the command is to render the table, but only once there's a click is found. I think if you took that out, if you take that out, I think you'll get an error message until you click it. So mm -hmm. I think the require um, function is saying, Okay, don't render anything until you click on it. Exactly. Nope. Yes, that didn't work. This is... That's what I use it for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know. It basically says wait until this object is non-null. And then and then render. Well, okay, so maybe it did do that because there was nothing that was going to be there in the first place. So I was I was digging in, I was digging a little bit into the docs what Connor said here, and then they they have these two concepts called truthy and false. And mm -hmm. it says it says something. We use these terms a little loosely here, but it will it will kind of like talk about like it is kind of like a true or false, and it kind of digs into some more precise things that's looking for like false nulls an empty atomic vector stuff like that so i'd have to dig a little bit more into what this truthy and falsy values mean but i think we get the general yeah. gist of what it's looking it's requiring that value yeah so we got a result here on this one um if we take off the req then we do get the error non-numeric argument to mathematical function and null. So, so it sounds like it tried to, it, it tried to do all these things. It tried to assign to X, assign to Y, print all these things out, render print, mm -hmm. try to do all of those in the absence of a plot click. I bet if you do in your console, if you do, like if you stop the app and just do rounds and then try to round like in quotes, A, like some character, I bet uh -huh. that's the same error. Yeah. yeah. So it's an error in the round because it was rounding. It's not getting an error. A, a null object. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great segue to my topic next week. <laughs> it was planned. Well, I was just. <laughs> no, I was gonna. I was gonna add a quick comment here. So the the so we're 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 adding another layer of user interface interactivity to actually cause the server to do something, right? So the, the, the first thought that comes to my mind in possibly a production level, Kevin, I'm thinking of you in the relation or maybe Connor in this relation, but um, if you had a web crawler, right? This web scraper, and you're not going to generate any code until you get a mouse click. Well, that web crawler is not gonna do that, right? So it's almost like a security type mechanism, but it's not security. It's like, I want some level of input from my user before I, uh, incur the cost of processing, you know, data output. Is that maybe yeah. you, I use it helps with the? Is it okay? Yeah, because people don't want to see that error message. They get confused and don't want to use it and say there's an error. So yeah. 
it's mostly aesthetics from my end. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Let's see if this works. This should, we were getting a null a second ago on this second output. So now we should get nothing. Hey, all right. Cool. Yeah. And then, so yeah, that's rec and then validate is like the next, the next step in, in putting, um, mm. like, yeah, you can put a nice message to tell seat belts and suspenders and belts under shiny stuff. So it doesn't break when it starts. Okay. I'm sure it's that's fine. in a separate chapter. Yeah. It's probably next week. Right. Cool. That's what I have, guys. Thanks for listening in and your your contributions. Um, I feel like I learned a lot. So, yeah. That's Thank you. So we're at the we're at the we're about the one mark. So I just want to again emphasize what Ryan was saying. Thanks, Ryan and Ryan. Um, we'll wrap up tonight. I mean, if people still have questions, um, I can hang out for a little bit longer. If other people have questions, don't feel like you need to hang out if you don't need to. Um, or have to, but uh, next week, Kevin's up. We'll talk about eight. Uh, I gotta remind myself, eight is user feedback. Um, so we'll get to that next week. And then if anybody's interested, there's still opportunities to do chapter nine, which is uploads and downloads. Just let me know if you're interested in doing that. I'll be available in the Slack to do, to um, just let me know, I'll be in the Slack. So cool. other than that, if people wanna hang out and ask some more questions, it's cool, if not, Everybody have a good rest of your night. Yes.